Welcome. This is my day four voice. Can anyone relate? Just means we're having fun, right? I'm Monica Samtani. I'm the founder of The Fem Word, and I'm here to introduce you to none other than Rohit Pargava. Now, many of you know, yep, many of you know him from his popular, non-obvious featured sessions in past South by Southwest events, and this year, he's going to offer you an all-new look at his non-obvious megatrends. How excited is that? Rohit is a three-time Wall Street Journal best-selling author. He is the founder of the Non-Obvious Company and Idea Press Publishing, a non-boring storyteller, and a proud uh, father of two boys. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Rohit Bhargava. I was not an entrepreneurial kid. In fact, I had my first big business idea when I was 23 years old, and it was going to transform the world of restaurants. I was going to create a directory of all restaurants in the area where I lived, which is DC. And this is what my awesome epic website looked like, <laughs> according to the Wayback Machine. And now I look at it, and I'm still pretty damn proud of my Photoshop skills, I got to say. They haven't progressed all that much. But when I created this website, I knew that I had to pitch it to someone who could actually get in in front of lots and lots of people. Now, here we are at South by Southwest, and many of you are in the midst of pitching something yourself. In fact, raise your hand nice and high if you're pitching something here at South by Southwest, either trying to change careers, or pitching your startup, or trying to get funding. I mean, a lot of us, right? And for me, when I was, OK, I see like a, some really gung-ho people in the front. That's awesome. When I was pitching this idea, I knew that the gatekeeper, remember, this is 1998, so the gatekeeper was AOL. And I had to pitch my website to AOL, and I got a meeting with the executive at AOL. And he had one of those, like, intimidating tables, right? So I got into this meeting, and I pitched my idea, and my pitch for DCRestaurants.com was, the world needs this. <laughs> and he agreed with me, which was awesome. But then he asked me a question that I wasn't ready for. He said, why does the world need you to do this? I did not have an epic answer for this question. In fact, I had no answer at all for this question. And my answer was, nothing. I didn't even come up with anything. I mean, that's the worst, the worst feeling. And I left that meeting so uh, disappointed with myself and DC Restaurants was an epic failure. And for 20 years after that, I didn't become an entrepreneur. I went and worked for somebody else until eventually I did become an entrepreneur again. But I learned something that day that's going to shape this entire talk about the future, which is that the people who understand people always win. And what you're going to see today in the trends that I share with you is not a focus on technology, even though there's lots of tech in the trends. What you're going to see is a focus on people. How do these trends change the way we think? How do they change what we believe, what we buy, what we sell, who we trust? That's what you're going to see. And I want to start by taking you backwards a little bit. I mean, the, the most, most non-obvious thing that a futurist can do is go backwards in history, right? And so let's go backwards in history, 2,000 years to the spice traders. And the spice traders had an amazing story that they used to tell of this bird, the Cinnamongus bird, which was a fierce bird that would build its nests out of these sticks, these flavorful, aromatic sticks. And these heroic hunters would have to swing this rock to knock these birds out of their nest in order to climb up this dangerous cliff to harvest these sticks. And the sticks were cinnamon. And eventually, we found out that this story was totally made up. There was no such bird as this, but it was all designed to inflate the value of these sticks. When I got into the world of advertising, approximately 2,000 years later, I started working on different campaigns. And we would get briefs like this. Old, shreddies, boring, new, diamond shreddies. <laughs> Just turn that shit sideways. Perfect. We hear about innovation all the time. I mean, everybody wants to be innovative, right? We have great innovative ideas, and then innovation turns out to be goat yoga. 
You want to see the most innovative guy that I came across in the last six months? This dude, who turns his hoodie around and eats his popcorn out of it. I mean, that is some pretty fucking epic innovation right there, is it not? Tell me your startup idea is better than what this guy came up with. Just tell me. But we see this all the time, right? And it's unbelievable. You have been unsubscribed. Please wait 28 days for this to take effect. Right? 28 days? That's how long it takes to get my name off of your email list for an email I didn't ask for in the first place? That's the problem. We are surrounded by bullshit. And the problem is that if we're surrounded by bullshit, then two things happen. One is we become so skeptical of everything that we just don't know what to trust anymore. And the second is that we decide for ourselves, well, if we're surrounded by bullshit, we may as well just join in and create our own bullshit. <laughs> and that's not a good solution either, because now we're swimming in even deeper bullshit for all of us. So the question is, how do we get past that? How do we do something better? How do we overcome what I call the modern believability crisis? Evian is naive spelled backwards. Is that a conspiracy theory? Is this water actually coming from some beautiful Swiss Alps, or is this Jersey water just repackaged? <laughs> Sorry to my Jersey friends, you know? Now, marketing and advertising has done this for a long, long time. More doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. Therefore, it must be good for you, right? This image has been retouched to lower your self-esteem. Because we don't feel good about ourselves. I mean, here's a real ad from Levi's that says hotness comes in all shapes and sizes, as long as you're one of those sizes. So what am I supposed to feel if I'm not one of those sizes? Am I not hot, according to Levi's? Why can't I be? The bro app is your certified wingman that automates your text so that you can pretend like you care about your girlfriend or your wife. How diabolical is this bullshit? There's products that are marketed as all natural. Cocoa Krispies, all natural. Is there a tree that we don't know about that grows this product? No. So how can it be all natural? Maybe we just need hot dog water. Oh, hot dog water. Let me tell you the pitch for hot dog water while you look at this delightful image. Perhaps before breakfast for some of you. Hot dog water rebalances the electrolytes in your system, according to the pitch. Therefore, it must be good for you. And they sold it for 20 plus dollars per bottle at a farmer's market in Manhattan. Until people eventually figured out it was a joke, right? But maybe if we just had a better pitch. <laughs> yes, these are Cheerios. If we just told people what we were doing, maybe that would be the solution. Just admit it, right? Maybe we just need to admit it. For two weeks straight, the number one video on YouTube was this video with a three-word caption, with three-word title, Squirrel Dodges Lamborghini. And it was literally a squirrel running across the track in a Lamborghini going 150 miles an hour, and the squirrel mostly makes it. His tail doesn't make it, but the squirrel makes it. Is whatever you have to offer as virally interesting as a squirrel dodging a fucking Lamborghini? Because that's your competition. That's what you're up against. And I'm not even making a joke about that. I'm selling you that seriously. Because that's what somebody's looking at, and that's their expectation, right before they see anything that you have to show them. Now media, it's really hard to tell with media what's real, because there's lyrical cures all the time. So I'm going to do a very quick poll with this audience. And this is a savvy audience. I mean, you're here at South by Southwest. You've seen lots of stuff, right? You're pretty savvy. So I'm going to share with you four headlines. And what I want you to do is decide for yourself which one of those four, each one of those four, which one's fake, which one's real. And then we're going to do a quick vote, OK? Are you ready? Yeah. All right. This is the interactive part of the presentation. Stretch it out if you need to, all right? OK. Number one story. Don't vote yet. This is just to hear the stories. Chemical and McDonald's fries could cure baldness. First story. Second story, new study finds 85% um, of Americans don't know all the dance moves to the national anthem. <laughs> Those damn Americans, they never get educated on the important things. Number three, no, you can't taste anything with your testicles. <laughs> and number four, a sassy seal accidentally slaps man across the face. 
with an octopus. All right. Now we are about to get into our voting. So story number one. Raise your hand nice and high if you believe this story is true. Nice and high. OK, a lot of skeptics about this. OK, hands down. Story number two. Who believes the study about the 85% of Americans with the dance moves? Who believes that's true? OK. You have a lot of faith in the stupidity of Americans. I like that. <laughs> number three. Who believes number three is real? Raise your hand. OK, hands down. And number four. Sassy seal accidentally slaps man across the face. Oh, you guys are on board with the seal. OK, here we go. Here's the big reveal. Are you ready? Who brought their drum roll? Let's go. That was so unsatisfying. OK, number one, real. Why is this real? Because apparently there's some chemical that can regrow hair. And then some online writer, not a journalist, there's a difference. Real journalists don't publish this bullshit. Online writer said, oh, that chemical is also in McDonald's fries. So I'll just write the story. It goes viral. I try it. It doesn't work. <laughs> so disappointing. So disappointing. But the story's real. Number two, fake. There are apparently more Americans that don't know. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> this is an onion headline. There apparently there are no dance moves to the national anthem. But God, there should be, right? I mean, really, wouldn't that be fun to watch people try and struggle through that? All right. Number three, no, you can't taste anything with your testicles. If you saw this meme on TikTok, then you know that this story was actually real. And number four, sassy seal accidentally slaps man across the face with an octopus. And you know you're going to Google this video afterwards because it was the slap heard around New Zealand. How good is that as a description of a video? And I'm going to give you a link, by the way, to, I should have told you this in the beginning, I'm going to give you a link at the end of my talk where you can download all of these slides so you can have a lean back experience and, uh, you know, just watch. Wow, I should get that much applause for uploading something. That's like epic. <laughs> uh, and all the videos that I mentioned, you'll be able to watch links to those videos on that URL as well and a bunch of other stuff. So um, if you are here because you convinced someone else to pay for you, uh, you will be able to justify your existence here uh, by the notes that you take through the slides. You can also do what I personally love, my favorite way of taking notes, which is with this device right here. You could just take a photo of a slide because you'll never hit that point where the speaker says, let me tell you five things. And then they tell you like things number one through three and you have lovely notes. And then thing number four goes by so fast that you missed it. And it's so unsatisfying, right? To have five things but only have four of them. So you won't have that if you take a photo of the slide. So that's my little hack that totally works at all conferences. And with the phones today, like even if you're all the way in the back, you'll still be able to see the slide. So what happens with all of this media is we just don't know what to trust, right? And I'm sort of making a joke about how hard it is to tell what's real and what isn't, but the fact that there's so much misinformation is not a joke. This is serious. I mean, this is causing serious problems in our culture. It's causing serious problems in how we interact with one another. Because if we choose our own truth that's not based on reality and someone else chooses a truth that disagrees with us, what happens? Big, big bad things happen because we can't see anyone else's perspective. And that's something we have to be able to shift. We have to be able to change it. Because it is harder to get anyone's attention than ever before. We literally need that tunnel vision sometimes to be able to get someone else's perspective. And that's the challenge. So how do we do that? How do we separate what actually matters from the noise? And if we are able to do that, if we are able to be what I call non-obvious thinkers, how does that lead us towards the future. And how does that lead us towards what I call the megatrends, the 10 megatrends? And I'm going to do something unusual for me today. Because I speak all over the world, but I never, ever include all 10 megatrends in one presentation. Because it's usually too much. It's too much content. But I think you can take it. <laughs> and I promised 10 in the description, and it would be kind of wrong to only give you five or seven. So you're going to get all 10 today. Yes. And we'll see how fast I could blow through it, and I will stay on time, because I know you have important stuff to do, and the last thing you want is for me to go over, even if you are enjoying yourself. So I have a timer here, and I'm going to be right on time. I promise you that as well. OK. 
problem with all this noise is that we think the solution is to just consume more. And imagine if you were really, really hungry and you showed up to one of these hot dog eating competitions. I don't know why I have so many damn hot dogs in this presentation. <laughs> just thought of that now. That's probably a bad choice. I don't even like hot dogs. Really, I don't. But imagine you were super hungry, you went to a competition like this, and you ate like 28 hot dogs in a minute or whatever these crazy people do. Would you feel good afterwards? No. You wouldn't be hungry probably, but you'd be sick. And yet that's what we often do when it comes to media. We focus on reading so much stuff and it's backwards. It's not the right way to do it. Because you can't get smarter by trying to consume everything. Instead, what if you could do what Isaac Asimov called be a speed understander? Not a speed reader, but a speed understander. I love this. This is my favorite quote ever. I mean, if speed understanders, they don't try and consume everything. They're not worried about, oh, what am I missing over there? I mean, I remember writing an article uh, one year after South by Southwest, uh, specifically. And it was based on this really demoralizing moment that I had when I looked at, I mean, every speaker, when you get a session at South by Southwest, is exciting, right? And so you look at what else is in your time slot. And I made the mistake of doing that that year. And I found a ton of things that I wanted to go to myself that I thought were actually more interesting than what I was going to talk about. <laughs> but you know how many things I found in the time slot, including parties, sessions, panels, everything else? 27. That meant there were 27 other interesting places that anyone who was in my audience could have been besides listening to me. That's a lot of pressure. Because now I have to be better than anything else you could have possibly gone to, and you have a ton of options. But what ended up happening for me and for many people in the audience was that was always in the back of their mind. And so they had guaranteed FOMO because they were missing out on something, but they guaranteed to miss out on what they were actually in also because they were thinking about all the other things they could have been at. And it was the most tragic thing because I realized in this moment that I was actually present for nothing because I was worried about what I was missing and I was not paying attention to where I was. And the reason I tell you that story is because it's an example of us trying to consume everything. Because we just know that there's so much stuff out there, and our time is valuable. None of our time, none of your time, is worth more than anyone else's time. And we don't have any more of it than anyone else, right? Maybe with daylight savings, we get like a screwed a little bit. But you know, mostly, we pretty much have the same time. So we have to choose how we spend it. So I thought a lot about that. And I thought, well, how am I going to bring this idea to life? of paying attention to what matters. And as I was thinking about that in relation to non-obvious and thinking in non-obvious ways, I started looking for non-obvious thinkers, non-obvious examples. And one of the non-obvious examples I found was from the Mexico 1968 Olympics, from one athlete who was about to change the course of his entire sport, even though no one knew it the night before the Olympics. So he was not the most gifted athlete, in fact, he wasn't the fastest, he wasn't the strongest, but he had figured out something about his sport that no one else before had done. And his sport was the high jump. And the high jump, for years and decades before, had always been done the same way. Someone would run up, and they would literally jump over the bar. <laughs> Makes sense. Some people would use like a weird scissors kick. I don't want to hurt myself, so I'm not going to try and do it. But they would do weird things, but they basically would run up to the bar and jump over, until Dick Fosbury decided to turn backwards and jump over. Today, that's called the Fosbury flop. And the Fosbury flop allows your center of gravity to get a little bit higher to clear the bar. And in 1968, using the Fosbury flop, he won the gold medal. And after that, every high jumper used the Fosbury flop. Why was he the guy that came up with this? I mean, how many people before him did this jump and never even thought of turning backwards and jumping over? And more importantly, what would it mean if you could think like that? To walk up to some situation where everyone had always gone this way and turn your body around and go the other way. What would that mean? What would that look like for you? Story of another two entrepreneurs, Hakeem and Sharif. And these two guys looked at the glasses market, the eyeglasses market, and they said, you know, most eyeglasses are designed for a certain type of shape, a certain type of nose bridge, and it doesn't account for the noses that we have, that our friends have. 
So they've changed the model, and they opened a company called Reframe that makes eyeglasses that fit people who don't have the traditional white Western nose. Again, something that they saw, no one else saw. How long have glasses been around? How long have people with different noses been wearing glasses? Uncomfortably, until these guys came along. So my question for all of us is how do you become that sort of person who sees what others miss? How do you become what I call a non-obvious thinker? Well, let's talk about the method that I've used for that. And the method is something that I call the haystack method. And every year for the last 10 years, up until non-obvious megatrends, I would publish a new trend report. And the trend report would have the most interesting ideas, stories, everything about the future. And non-obvious megatrends came out conveniently <laughs> two months before the pandemic hit. So now the question is, well, you published a book about trends and about the future before the pandemic when everything changed. So it can't possibly be right anymore, right? Everything must have changed. And so I spent the last two years researching that, thinking about that, talking about that. And what I didn't do is say, well, I must be right no matter what, so let me go out and find all the ways that can prove that I was right, which would be the typical futurist thing to do. Instead, I went out and said, well, how is the world actually changing? And what does that actually mean for the trend? And that's what I'm gonna try and share with you today. And what I'll start with is me consuming this stuff. And we did this photo as a photo shoot that was a really fun experiment. Some of you might have seen some of the photos of this uh, that went viral and they were in the South by Southwest magazine like a couple years ago as well. But it's an indication. It's an indication of the noise that we're all consuming and how we need to filter through that noise and what we need to do. And for me, what it involves is something that I call the haystack method. And the haystack method is a process that allows you to, instead of trying to stick a needle, in the, find the needle in the middle of a haystack, it allows you to assemble all this hay and put the needle in yourself. That's the goal. So how can you do that? Well, first it starts by transforming what you're reading. This is how I read books. I put these little colored tabs, these reading flags in, to try and save the most interesting ideas. I read magazines that are not targeted at me. Modern Farmer magazine. Right, not a modern farmer. Teen Vogue magazine, I'm definitely not a 16 year old girl. But the more I read these magazines that are not targeted at me, the more chance I get to step into someone else's world. And the thing is, like, we don't get a chance to do that very often. Because we've gotten really, really good at sending that last message before we basically kill ourselves, right? <laughs> but we're not looking up, we're not paying attention. And social media is not helping either, right? Because what social media does is it presents the same stories that you already agree with, written by people that you already know who think like you. And then Facebook introduces a a hate button, right, an anger button, basically. And the anger button is the worst because what the anger button says is that something made you angry and Facebook's algorithm looks at your hitting that anger button and does the calculation in the background and says, oh, that's engagement. You must enjoy being angry. Here's more shit to make you more angry. That's the way it works, right? And we end up more and more angry and we end up more and more outraged because of that. And we don't ever hear anyone else's perspective outside of that. And we have to do better than that. I get to be on all different stages, talking to all different people, learning from them. But I have to be willing to listen to that. I have to be willing to listen. And you are currently at an event with lots of people who think in lots of different ways. And if you show up to only a few things, and you only talk to the people who you already came with, you are missing out on a chance. And you know what would happen if you randomly walked up to someone at South by Southwest you didn't know and started a conversation? They would talk to you. <laughs> That's what they would do. It's awesome. You're at a conference here in person. Just appreciate how awesome that is. After all of this time of us getting stuck. Yeah. But if you're not going to take advantage of it, then why be here? And I know that not everyone has the sort of personality to randomly go up to a stranger. And believe it or not, I don't really have that personality either. My wife has that personality much more than I do. I am on stage, so I seem like a stage guy, but when I'm off stage, I don't really prefer to go and talk to people. But sometimes I know that they're feeling just as uncomfortable as I'm feeling, 
by standing around. And so I might as well start the conversation, right? Now, capturing ideas is also important no matter what process you use. For me, I actually use a printed notebook. I actually like printed notebooks. It gives me a chance to actually capture ideas and save them. You don't have to do that. Whatever you do to capture information, <clears throat> eventually the key is to start to spot the connections between the information. And so what I want to show you right now is a little time lapse video of what this process looks like for me every year. So I'm capturing different ideas from magazines, from newspapers, from notes that I've taken, uh, from things that I've watched, and I'm putting them together based on what the themes are. And eventually the themes are elevated into connections. And the connections are, oh, this theme relates to that theme. They're all kind of saying something similar about the way that the world is shifting. I pull that together and I write a trend. And in this case, the trend was the true thing, which is people seeking the truth for themselves because they don't know what to believe. It eventually turns into an outline, and the outline turns into a chapter in the book. So that's the way the process works for me. That's the haystack method. And when I put all those pieces together, I identify what I call non-obvious trends. And non-obvious trends are unique, curated observations of the accelerating present. And the accelerating present is the important part, because what it says is that the present is moving faster, but there's signs of the future right now. It's not like I'm predicting something that could happen that hasn't happened yet. I'm always looking at things that are happening right now. So now let's talk about the trends. Let's talk about the 10 mega trends. And I promised you all 10, so that's what we're going to do. So let's roll through these, and this is where we're going to get a little bit faster. But like I said, I'm going to give you all the slides with all the descriptions and everything afterwards, so you'll have them all. And you can always use their camera to take photos of any of this stuff as well. So let's roll. The first trend, amplified identity. As individualism rises, people are cultivating how they're perceived. They're cultivating their image. And sometimes it leads them to do some pretty stupid things because we're trying to change and shape the perception of how we're being seen in the world. And sometimes it's different on different platforms. We have different perceptions of how we are on different platforms. There's a website called This Person Does Not Exist. And you can generate faces of people that don't exist. And all of these images you're looking at right now are not actual people. They're generated faces. But you can't tell. You can't tell that they're not real. And that's what's going to start happening. So we talk about the metaverse and how we're going to exist in the metaverse. And there isn't just going to be one metaverse, because you don't just have one social media profile. There's going to be lots of different metaverses. And then there's the multiverse from like Marvel, right? Where we have infinite possibilities. And maybe there's a meta multiverse coming. But the point is that the way we curate our identity in all of these different places is going to actually end up shaping how people see us. And we're going to want to control that and perhaps have it be different in different platforms. And so the stealable idea, and this is one thing that I'm going to do with all of the trends. Not only am I going to tell you what the trend is and give you some examples, but I'm going to give you a stealable idea for each one. And the stealable idea here is how do you think about preparing for what I'm go going to call now our identity divide? The idea that my identity over here is different than my identity over here. Sometimes if it's in a full metaverse, my, my uh, avatar is going to look different. I'm going to act different. I'm going to have different skill sets. I'm going to portray myself differently based on what the platform is. So how do we get ready for that as consumers, and how do we get ready for that as businesses if we're going to have to interact with someone who has multiple personalities? It's creating some big, big questions. Second big trend, ungendering. Removing gendering from things that really didn't need it in the first place, but traditionally had it, and changing our understanding of gender identity in the process. More and more licenses and passports are allowing gender X as an option. That's one met macro sign. Yeah, clap for that. It's great. It's great. Ungendered clothing. So we're removing the kind of men's clothing, female clothing. Now we can have ungendered clothing as well. Boy and girl toy aisles are being phased out at retail locations across the world. Yeah, this is great. I mean, why should we have one aisle for uh, you know, that says you can only play with this type of toy. Is that the world we want our kids to grow up in, where they're limited to only do one thing or another? We're changing stereotypes. One of the fastest growing audiences buying Harley Davidson motorcycles is women. And before, they would never market to women. But now it's one of their fastest growing audiences. 
There's apps like the Man Interruption app that allows you to test how often a woman gets interrupted in a meeting by a lower pitched voice. <laughs> so now there's actual data, there's actual proof that this is happening. I mean, every woman knows it's already happening, but now there's actual proof that it's happening that you can use through this app or tools like that that are changing the dynamic. I wrote deeply about this with my co-author Jennifer Brown. We had a session on this on Friday for Beyond Diversity. And what we talked about in Beyond Diversity was reshaping the way that we see people based on these external factors, based on their ethnicity, based on their gender, based on their sexual preference, based on uh, of sexual identity, based on you know any of these things. We change our perception. So how do we actually create a more inclusive world? And to start with, with this trend, how do we remove this long-standing gender bias that's been around for a long, long time and in so many different ways? And I'm sure that many of you have other examples you're thinking of immediately where you know that this is something that's been sticking around in the companies or the organizations that you interact with. And we have to be able to find it, confront it, and change it. That's what this trend is focused on. Third big trend, instant knowledge. Instant knowledge is the idea that we consume bite-sized knowledge and we expect to be able to do that. And sometimes it leads to really uh, heart-wrenching stuff, really uh, scary stuff. Like for example, this eight-year-old who taught himself how to drive on YouTube because he wanted a burger at McDonald's. And once he drove to McDonald's and the staff there thought that they were being uh, punked, and then they realized that actually uh, he was driving himself, called the cops, cops came, interviewed the kid, called the parents, kid's crying, and basically the story was the kid taught him, literally taught himself how to drive on YouTube because he just wanted a burger, and he took his little sister with him. <laughs> I don't know if that's a good big brother or a bad one, I, I can't decide there, it's hard. But imagine what that kid is going to say 10 years from now when he has that conversation with his parents about going to college for four years. And this kid says, I taught myself how to drive on YouTube when I was eight. What am I going to get from a four-year college education that I couldn't get online, that I can't teach myself? And the flip side of that is that we forget the value of mastery. We don't appreciate it. One of the most powerful stories I remember hearing listening to a behavioral psychologist talk on the stage was about a locksmith, a master locksmith, who had spent decades honing his craft to be able to open anything. I mean, this guy was like the safe cracker guy that the, the FBI goes to to open the safe from the bad guys when they, when they seize the assets, right? So he could open anything. But that business isn't you know, reliable all the time, so he has to work as a quote unquote regular locksmith as well, which means he has to unlock people's doors who lock themselves out of their house. So this guy goes to someone's house to unlock their door, they say, I'm locked out of my house. How much time do you think it takes a master locksmith who can crack you know, huge FBI uh, criminal safes, how long do you think it would take that guy to open the door to your house? Seconds. The problem is, he shows up to the house, opens the door in seconds, he says, that'll be 150 bucks, and the person says, what? That took you two seconds. Why should I pay 150 bucks for that? So now, he's forced to go to your house, take his full bag of tools that he knows he doesn't need, spread them out on the ground, use the wrong tool on purpose, work with the door, wipe his thing, ask for a bottle of water, do all of this stuff, and then he uses the tool that he knew would work in the first place, opens the door, and he says 150 bucks, and the person says, here you go. That's what we're forced to do now, to appreciate the value of that mastery. Now, it's more than just being able to learn small things, it's entire platforms. So Fender's built an entire platform to help people learn how to play the guitar faster. And not just learn how to play the guitar faster, but learn how to play the song that they wanted to play the guitar to learn, that favorite song. Because what Fender knows is if they're able to get that song to be played by the person faster, then that person will stick with the guitar. And when they stick with the guitar, I, I, I kind of want to ask, but I kind of don't want to ask how many people have started playing the guitar and then given up. Because I know it's going to be a lot of people in here. OK, yeah, me too. But they want, the, they want all of us to stick with the guitar, because then we buy more guitars. And so this whole platform is designed to help us do that. 
Tasty cooking videos are viewed more than 500 million times per month. Why? Because they help us answer what, for many of us, is the most urgent question every afternoon. What's for dinner? We've got to figure that out. So the tasty cooking videos help us figure that out. And now there's technology, passive haptic learning. So these gloves use pulses to be able to teach someone how to play the piano when they're not really paying attention to how to learn. And actually, what ends up happening is after you use these gloves, you can literally learn how to play the piano in 20 minutes with passive haptic learning. How's that for instant knowledge? So the stealable idea here is how do we all help people get smarter faster? And if you work in marketing, you might call this content marketing. There's many other ways to term it, but the idea here is how do we make people faster, smarter? Smarter, faster, sorry. All right, next trend, revivalism. Revivalism is the idea that when we are, have so much technology and so much complexity, we want to turn the clock backwards. We need to, to things that we know, that we remember, that we trust. That's why people are listening to music on vinyl again. Kodak is making film, actual film, for diehard photographers. All of these uh, um, uh, media and entertainment efforts that happened during the pandemic where the cast of Back to the Future came back together after 20 years or even more than 20 years, whatever the number of years was, 30 years, to do a table read from this movie, taking us back in time. We're trusting paper, paper ballots instead of digital ballots because people don't trust the electronic ballots anymore, so a lot of precincts are going back to paper. Taking notes on paper, which I already mentioned I do. Many of you probably do as well, instead of digital notes. So the question here is how do we go retro to inspire more trust? How could we turn the clock back to inspire trust? Next trend, human mode. Human mode is we have so much technology that drives us apart that we just want to connect with one another. We want a more human experience. I mean, the most beautifully empathetic human experience is Tesco in the UK does a relaxed checkout line, a slow checkout. for people who just need a little bit more time. Now, if you're already thinking in your head, man, I wish I don't get stuck behind him, right? Then you're not the target audience for this. <laughs> but imagine people who have dementia, people who have Alzheimer's. I mean, they need a little bit of extra time. They need a human interaction. And just because you want to get in and out as fast as you can doesn't mean the automated kiosk is the best for everyone. And isn't it amazing the empathy involved in creating something like that? At Herbal Essences, Sam Latif is an employee that works on creating more inclusive products. And Herbal Essences shampoo bottles have lines or dots to help blind people and people who are visually impaired to tell the difference between the two bottles. And guess who else this is awesome for? Anyone else who has their fucking eyes closed in the shower, which is literally everybody. <laughs> so sometimes we create this innovation that seems to be for a small group but ends up being useful for everybody. And that's humanity. That's human mode in action. Starbucks has a store staffed almost entirely by deaf and hard of hearing people. And guess what customers do when they're regulars going into the store, whether they are deaf or hard of hearing themselves? They have taught themselves how to order their drinks in sign language, because that's the culture in the store. Olay's created bottle caps that are actually easier to open for people with disabilities. Because depending on your disability, some of these bottle caps are impossible to get open without using two hands in a certain way. But this bottle is much easier. So all of these things point to this idea that we have a potential strategy for our products and for our services that is made with empathy. Not made in the US or made in China or geographically what the sticker is, but made with empathy. How much more things could we make with empathy? Adding the human mode in, and how much better could that be, not just for a small group of people who might need it, but for everyone else also. Next big trend, attention wealth. Your attention is important. Important to lots and lots of people. And they're trying to capture it. 
in many different ways. The problem is there's so much sensationalism in how that's trying to be captured that we're becoming wary of it. We're, we don't want to give our attention to all of those different things. So now Red Bull has Flugtag, which is people creating these insane things and then launching them off of a, um, off of a uh, dock and trying to see the farthest that they can fly. And most of them pretty much fly as far as this thing looks like it's about to fly, which is straight down. And if you get a little bit of distance, you can actually win the fluke talk. Reese's had this inspired candy converter at Halloween where they said, look, take all that candy that you don't want, take the Almond Joy, stick that crap inside of our machine, and we'll give you Reese's, which you actually do want. <laughs> That's pretty smart. I mean, who, would make, who wouldn't make that trade, right? And sorry if you're an aficionado of the Almond Joy. Cheetos Museum. Send in your Cheetos that look like famous people or famous birds. I mean, who needs a Smithsonian when we have this, right? <laughs> Cheetos Museum. So what do we have to do? We have to beware of the spectacle because there are some really fun spectacle out there. And it's, I mean, look, the Cheetos Museum, it's fun, right? But the thing is, if you're only paying attention to spectacle like that and nothing that's actually important, that says something about the world, that you, alerts us to what's going on in the world, that's a problem. Because that is not complete, right? And I get that that's more fun to read about than some of the other things that are happening in the world. But that doesn't mean that we should only give our attention to those. Next big trend, purposeful profit. These two things used to be separate, now they're coming together again. I mean, startups, more and more, I hear startup pitches from founders, and it's not enough to have the lemonade stand unless it's gonna save the world. There's a lot of pressure on us to have that big social mission, to do something bigger. I mean, Inglorious Fruits and Vegetables was a beautiful campaign uh, by a French supermarket chain that said all of these fruits and vegetables that are being thrown away because they don't look the way that we expect them to look, why are we throwing them away? That's so much food wastage we should actually be eating it. And they have a brilliant campaign where they say, imagine the difference, like how does the juice from an apple that looks like that, what's the difference between the taste of that and a regular apple? No difference, it tastes the same. So why are we throwing this stuff away? That's purposeful profit. Patagonia is amazing with this. I mean, they invite people to trade their gear in, to sell their old gear. They have ads that have run for many, many years saying, don't buy this jacket. Use the old one. Use the old stuff so it doesn't go in landfills. Repurpose. How can you take a stand with your brand to show those values? What would that be mean for you? Next big trend, data abundance. I mean, we hear a lot about data. There's entire sessions dedicated to it. I mean, we are the product, right? You've heard that before. You're progenerating the data that many different companies and organizations are profiting off of. I mean, there's so much data out there. By some estimates, 90% of the world's data was created in the last two years. That's how fast it's accelerating. And what it's leading to, in many cases, is what I call data pollution. Because we have so much data that's just extraneous that doesn't actually give us any useful data, useful information, but we're still seeing it leveraged. We're still seeing it used in sometimes dangerous ways. So the stealable idea behind this data pollution is how do we ask better questions and seek more insight? If you're working in a role that requires data, really question what that data is truly telling you and whether you're making common statistical mistakes. If you're taking 51% of people doing something as conclusive, I mean, on the level, that's pretty stupid. That's 50-50. That's not conclusive, right? But so many times we say, oh, it's just slightly more, so therefore, the majority of people. Five out of 10 dentists prefer something. Oh, great, five out of 10 don't, right? <laughs> I mean, let's read through some of the data sometimes. Let's not get stuck with this data pollution. Next big trend, protective tech. We are expecting now technology to protect us, technology to proactively step in to help us be better, safer, take care of ourselves, not make stupid decisions. You get the credit card alert saying, hey, did you mean to spend as much as you just spent on drinks in Austin last night? <laughs> and it's up to you to uh, 
you know, pretend like you didn't, but then you have to actually send the alert and say, yeah, you know, I guess that is what I spent <laughs> accidentally. And I better go back and pick up my card from the desk if you've ever done that. Here's a, a couple of other uh, uh, options, right? The June Intelligent Oven, which decides how long to cook something based on the cameras on the inside. So you don't have to set any uh, numbers or anything like that. I mean, that is the ultimate in adulting right there. <laughs> oven that decides how long to cook stuff. And by the way, there's a food sniffer where you can hover it over food to tell you if the food has gone bad or not, because you can't use this fucking device on your face anymore <laughs> for that. You need a food sniffer device to tell you. Predictive protection. There's great tools that allow you to actually identify bias in the language and how you're actually um, writing and whether you're using language that is likely to be mistaken. There's entire apps that proactively fight your parking ticket for you. So you've got a pr pr parking ticket, you scan the ticket, send it through the thing, it already sends the dispute for you and tries to get you out of that parking ticket. How's that for useful AI? So how do we prioritize being useful? Because that's what protective tech does for us. It allows us to be useful. All right, this is the final trend, flux commerce. The flux commerce is the idea that the lines between industries are starting to shift. So you're seeing that companies that used to be in one space are shifting. Crayola used to be about the crayons and the art, and now they have a makeup line, because makeup is basically painting your face. Makes sense. Brand extension. Capital One, coffee shops, right? Bank, but also coffee shops. Taco Bell had a hotel that was sold out for the amount of time that they did it, that apparently had rooms that smelled like Taco Bell. <laughs> Not my idea of a good way to fall asleep. But for Taco Bell fr fans, this was epic. This was great. They loved it. Apple had credit cards. This whiskey is aged for as little as two days. Because we've seen the news, man. The polar ice caps are melting. We can't wait for 30 years to drink this stuff. We've got to drink it now. Who knows what's going to happen in the future. But Cleveland Whiskey does an amazing job rethinking the common elements of whiskey making. And what they say is, look, why do we have to age whiskey in oak barrels? Why can't we just use wood chips and uh, age it in metal barrels? And what would the flavor be like? And the flavor is very different. Not necessarily bad, it's just different. And then there's the Hutzler 571 Banana Slicer, <laughs> which is a breakout product that has been delighting thousands of people on Amazon with well over 8,000 reviews from people who rave about this product talking about how it saved their marriage. <laughs> their life is complete with this banana slicer. This banana slicer has transformed the way that people have breakfast in many ways. But unfortunately, not everybody loves the banana slicer. I mean, it has some one-star reviews. It, one guy is particularly angry about the banana slicer. He says, this banana slicer does not work! Exclamation point! Exclamation point! Exclamation point, all caps. And then underneath, he writes, goes, all my bananas curve the opposite direction. <laughs> if you haven't figured it out by now, <laughs> the banana slicer is a joke. But it's also a competition. And the competition is, who could create the most ridiculous review for this most ridiculous product? And they're laughing all the way to the bank because this sells. The banana slicer sells because it doesn't take itself too seriously. It's willing to be in between different places. It's willing to be a media property as well as a kitchen appliance product. And that's OK because the assumption is that you want all positive reviews. The reality, as seen by the banana slicer, is that sometimes having really funny negative reviews Helps you sell more product. And that's what's happened for them. So how do we all disrupt those assumptions in our industry? That a hotel room shouldn't smell like fast food. <laughs> or that we should stick to the vertical that we have. That is the challenge. How do we do that? So what I've tried to do in this presentation is give you lots of different ideas 
that will start not a fire, sparks. That's what I want you to think about with all of these non-obvious trends. How do you take any one of these ideas and make it something that could change how you do your business, how you actually interact with the world? What could you do to actually take one of these ideas and put them into action to be more of a non-obvious thinker yourself? Because remember, Isaac Asimov said, he's not a speed reader, he's a speed understander. And I believe we all can do this. I am not a person who stands up here saying, I'm the only smart guy who could figure out these trends. I believe we all have the capacity to do that. And what I hope you got from today was some tools and ways to be able to do that. So a couple more things that I will leave you with. One is, if you want those slides, uh, this is the QR code for the website where you can go register. Uh, once you register on there, you'll get the slides. And also, every Thursday, I send out a weekly newsletter, which is the non-obvious insights newsletter. It's the most interesting stories of the week that are selected by me. I spend hours and hours on it every week. Uh, so you'll get that. Uh, give it a shot. And if you don't like it, you can always unsubscribe. No big deal uh, if it's not your thing. But you can definitely get access to that. And the last thing I will tell you is I'm about to do a book signing. And guess what we are going to have there? <laughs> Banana slicers. Yes, indeed. So if you want your very own banana slicer to proudly show to your kids, grandkids, and generations to come, and they're not even paying me for this pitch, you can get one of those for free if you come to the book signing and lots of other stuff as well. So I hope you stay connected. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being awesome. I love you.